Uh, my name is Paul Price. Welcome to Busy Bee. Um, this is our first orchid class for the season. Um, how many of you were here during the summer in July when we did the mounting class? Okay. You remember the orchid that we put on the bamboo? It's hanging up in the shade house. Take a look at it. It's grown considerably on that bamboo. Today what I wanted to talk to you about primarily were Phalaenopsis. We're coming into the time of year when Phalaenopsis are really available. That's what most people are looking for. Um, they are the most popular potted plant in the country now. They, have, they are outselling the poinsettia. So poinsettias used to be the number one sold, the most sold potted plant in the country. It is now the Phalaenopsis orchids. Um, they're grown as throwaway plants. I'm here to tell you don't throw them away. Get them to rebloom, mount them on the trees. You can see up behind me on the tree. Um, we put a couple on the tree um, during the last class in July. Those are pretty much attached. So the green stretch tape that's holding them on there can probably come off today. I'll have to take a closer look at them. Um, once you get the fails, they bloom, they drop their flowers. Most people go, what do I do with it? Well, you have to give it a chance to go through a cycle to rebloom. The only way that you're gonna get a fail to bloom is it has to, and that's why it's popular this time of year, is they have to have a temperature difference from daytime and nighttime temperature for about two weeks for about mm, 15 to 20 degrees. So it's gotta be 80 during the day and around 60, 65 during the evening to get them to initiate the flower spike. You've gotta have that weather pattern for about two weeks to initiate the flower spike. Once the flower spike is initiated, it's gonna to continue to grow, but it takes that temperature to get them to do that. Now, it used to be that you could only buy fails um, from say the end of December through Mother's Day. That's the only time of year that they used to be available. They are now available year round. The reason being is that they're taking greenhouses um, where they grow them out. Most of, well, not most of them. All your Phalaenopsis are started in China. They are shipped here as little plants and little pots. They're taken out, they're potted up into a larger pot. They're put in the greenhouses and they finish them off and get them to bloom here. What they do is in the greenhouses, they'll take a row of benches and they'll move them into one section. In that one section, they'll close the sides down with plastic and on the end, they've got an air conditioning unit and they drop the temperature every night in that section for two weeks. It initiates the flower spikes. Once the flower spikes start to emerge, they pull that crop, move them out into another area in the set of greenhouses and bring in the next set and do that. So they've always constantly got a crop going throughout the year. Um, like I said, most of the time, typically the bloom time for Phalaenopsis was December through May. Phalaenopsis, um, they come in a range of different colors, spots, you know, blotches, stripes, solid colors. Um, you can get them just about every color from purple to white to red, um, yellow, pink, um, no blue. How many of you have seen the blue ones in the big box stores? Those are not real, those are dyed. Um, when it reblooms next year, it's gonna be white. So, you know, don't let anybody fool you that it's a blue orchid, so it's not. Um, it, treat it as, it as what it is, it's a novelty. Um, it's like when we were in high school, you used to get, you know, colored carnations at like Valentine's Day and stuff like that. That's what these things equate to. Um, there is, there is a question whether or not that they will continue to live because that dye has gone through the vascular system of the plant. So we're not sure what the long-term success or viability of that plant is after it's had that dye put in the veins. Um, so it's, you know, buy at your own risk, enjoy them. They're fun, um, they're neat. Fails, 
For some people are easy to grow, for other people like me, I kill them. I don't know why. Um, it's probably because I overwater. When I water, I water a lot. I grow mostly Schomburkias and Cattleyas and Vandas. Um, so I have a tendency to overwater them, so I kill them typically. I've got a couple in the house now that are doing well that are not in the greenhouse with the rest of the orchids, so they're still living. What I should probably do is try and mount them on something and then grow them in the greenhouse that way. They'll probably live better for me. But when I water, I water heavy. Um, I want to talk about what we pot them in and how they're grown. Phalaenopsis, when we grow them in the industry for you guys to take home, we put them in a pot, put them in sphagnum moss, and they're in a, a, you know, a pot with moss like this. This is not how this plant normally grows, all right? And there's a reason for that. When you water these guys, you want to water the moss. You don't want to water the whole plant or the flowers. The white Phalaenopsis especially, um, if you water the flowers, they have a tendency to get little like pencil dot spots on the flowers. That's called botrytis. It is a fungus. It won't hurt the plant, it just makes the flowers look ugly. Um, the Phalaenopsis, when they typically grow, just like this one back here, are usually growing on a tree, hanging down. The reason for that is so that water doesn't collect in the crown. Now there's a handout that we gave you that will mention that you don't want to keep water in this crown because it will rot the top of it out. So if you do water from the top, you happen to get some water in here, just blow it out, try and get the moisture back out of that crown, okay? Um, easy plant to grow if you grow it correctly. With me, unfortunately, because I overwater, I have a little more difficulty with them. Um, I grow mostly orchids with pseudobulbs, um, and they dry out in between watering pretty hard. I dry them out pretty hard in between watering, but when I do water, they get soaked for about half an hour. The sprinklers are going off for usually about half an hour inside the greenhouse when I water. So they get wet, and I mean they get really wet. Um, the key to any orchid is not too much water. When you take this home, um, typically most of them are going to come. I don't think there are any fail growers that are growing in clay anymore. They're all growing them in plastic pots. For those of you that don't know, there is a severe shortage in plastic pots right now. That's plastic pots, plastic trays, any injected plastic because of that supply chain issue. Um, they're getting really hard to get, so you're going to start seeing these hard plastic pots going away, and they're going to a soft, molded, like, um, I would call it almost like a cup. Um, it's not a hard shell plastic, it's a soft, like, paper vinyl, almost like a really thick paper or plastic bag. That's what they're going to now, because they can't get these. So... You know, the sizes are going to be the same, but the containers are going to be a little bit different. My next orchid shipment will come from a grower that is growing in those pots and not in the hard pots like this. So, you know, you're going to go, well, that's not a six inch orchid. It technically is. Um, when they sell them, they sell them by the pot size, which is either a six inch or a four inch down there in the little ones. So the, the pot sizes may vary, but just be, you know, understanding that there is a really bad shortage. How many of you know that? Okay. Um, the Tariq Vandas, how many of you have seen me talk about these guys? All right, I've had a, a whole case of pots on order for me to pot up all my cuttings at home for six months. I can't get them. So, unfortunately, that supply chain, somebody needs to tell California to get its act together and get stuff out. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about is how to take care of this, um, how to get it to bloom, and then what to do with it once it's done blooming. 
Um, how many of you have, let's, let's do this. How, we'll start out this way. How many of you have orchids at home? All right, let's start with the count again, because this is always fun to do. All right, how many of you have, say, maybe 10 orchids? Okay, how many of you have 20? 50. 50. Really? Nobody over 50? Oh, come on. How many? Okay. Y'all need to catch up. By the next orchid class, I better see a bunch more hands. All right. <laughs> That, that in itself can be somewhat of a nightmare when we start getting cold every night. Then you have to do that, what we call the orchid shuffle, where you take them in and out every night. Yeah. Um, guess how many orchids I'm moving when I move? <laughs> how many? 600. That's just in the greenhouse. That's not all the cutting. So that's not all the cuttings and not all the plants that are potted up as cuttings. Um, that's just in the greenhouse. Right now, they're all on their own because the sides have come off the, the old greenhouse and I'm starting to move plants and benches out. So I'm hoping we don't get a freeze yet. Shh. Shh. Hush. Don't you say that. <laughs> Um, all right, let's, let's talk about this real quick. I want to talk about temperature before we go any further because we're headed into that time of year. The temperature is, once you get to 50 degrees, you have three different orchid species or types that don't like to go below 50. And that's your hard cane dendrobiums. These guys? Hard cane dendrobiums. Okay. These guys do not like to go below 50. They will drop all the leaves off this cane. Next year, it'll send up a new cane. You'll get all new leaves. You'll have a bare cane on the back. Just because it's bare, don't cut it off because that pseudobulb still acts as a battery. So leave it alone. The other orchids that don't like to go below 50 are Vandas. They'll do the same thing. They'll drop all the lower leaves and you'll get a plant that looks like a palm tree with a bare stalk with a bunch of roots hanging down. So once you start going towards 50, bring it inside if it's hanging up in a pot. If it's mounted on the tree, and you're gonna find this with this Vanda that's mounted on the tree, they, they have a tendency to get some protection from the tree itself. So one, frost doesn't land on them. Um, two, there's something about the tree itself that helps protect that orchid from cold and they don't drop their leaves like they do if they're in a basket. I think what it is more is it's more wind that does damage to them than it is the actual cold itself unless we go into a freezing temperature. Um, this one, you know, it's on here. It's still got all its leaves in the back. So, you know, it's gone from July till now. It's doing pretty good. So we'll have to watch it and see what it does, you know, November, December, January, February, because those are typically our coldest months. We do get a couple of cold snaps in March sometimes. You can get a freeze in this area up to the full moon in March. So be aware of that. Don't be surprised if you do get one. From what I've been hearing from people, they're expecting this to be a cold winter. So I don't know what to expect yet. Knowing my luck, because I'm moving an orchid house, it's gonna be a cold winter. So it never fails. Um, the other orchid that does not like to go below 50 are Phalaenopsis. Um, below 50 degrees towards freezing, the white ones, if they're in bud, will blast every flower bud on them. They'll turn yellow and fall off. So those are the three orchids that you wanna try and keep above 50 degrees without fail. Now, there are varieties that you can let stay out down to, I would say, 34 degrees before you have to start worrying about them freezing. Any of the Cataleas, anything with a hard pseudobulb on them, like any of the Oncidiums, these guys will take that cooler weather. 
there are Dendrobium nobles. How many of you have seen these in the stores? They get the flowers all the way up the cane. Um, these guys love cold weather and they will bloom better with cold weather. These are extremely um, well suited to grow in our area. So I've been trying to get more and more of them. Um, I'm not gonna see any more until probably, I would say sometime in the spring when they start blooming. I don't know if Better Grow will send any more out to me in the bagged orchids. Right now they're having a shortage on these. So I'm hoping I can get some more, but they really are impressive plants when you put them in a six inch pot with sphagnum moss and hang them up outside underneath the tree or even hang them out where they get direct full sunlight. They'll take full sunlight, but you have to water them every day if you give them full sunlight. Um, once a year. When they flower, once a year, and it's usually for about mm, three weeks. Now, this little orchid, and I've got quite a few of them, this is Dendrobium aggregatum. It's another one of those types of orchids that likes cooler weather. Will bloom better in the spring if it's exposed to some cooler weather. Um, these are actually pretty incredible when it gets to be a big size plant. You get a big golden ball or a golden ball of yellow flowers on them. Looks like a bunch of cluster of grapes hanging off of a, off a plant. Really fun orchid, really good to grow in a basket, not in a pot. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit about um, food. Because we're going into the colder months, what happens with plants when we get cold? Dormancy. A lot of plants will go dormant during the winter and don't want fertilizer. Um, orchids, there are a few orchid species that don't want fertilizer during the winter. One of those is this guy, the Dendrobium nobles. They don't want fertilizer from October till the spring when they have flower buds on them. Not just little spikes, they have to have actual flower buds on them. So you don't fertilize these during the winter, you put them to bed for the winter. They can get watered, but not fertilized. Um, any of the Cristata, there, there's a bunch of different forms of dendrobiums. Um, this is what they call the Cristata form. Um, it's any of the ones that have a flower spike that hangs down like a cluster of grapes. These guys take the colder weather. They want a winter rest also. What do you do with them in the hot weather? Water and fertilize them. Yep. Um, when, they're, when they're in growth, you feed the daylights out of them. They want food every week. Um, and water just about every other day. So you feed them and water them heavily when they're in growth mode. Um, when they start to go dormant. Now, this during the winter and the cold, we'll drop every leaf off of it. That's normal, that's to be expected with this because it does go dormant. Um, and to get it to bloom better, you want it to drop all those leaves so that in the spring when it starts to produce the flower buds, because at each axis with each leaf, a flower spike will come out and you'll get two or three flowers off that spike. That cane should have flowers all the way up and down that cane. So you do have to stress them out a little bit to get them to bloom better. Now, would I suggest that you do that with the fails? No. Would I suggest you do that with Vandas? No. Um, would I suggest you do it with um, the hard cane dens? No. Still water and feed them. They, they'll still take it. But there's just a couple of varieties that do take a winter rest. So keep that in mind. Now, with cooler weather, what happens inside the pot? It does. Cooler weather, they don't dry out as fast. So watch your watering. You may not want to apply as much water like you would during the summer. The way a plant works in the summer is it, it's taking water up from the roots and it will evaporate root water out through the leaves. It's called transpiration. It's how the plant cools itself off in the hot weather. During the winter, it's not hot, it's, it doesn't need to do that as much. So it's not doing that. So hold, 
you know, ease up on your watering during the winter a little bit, okay? Now, if the plants stay wet too long, they rot. The roots will rot, you'll lose the plant, okay? That's too much water during the winter. Um, fertilizer, how many of you fertilize your orchids? Okay, how many of you have orchids and you haven't fed them in a month, two months? Raise your hands because it happens. It happens to everybody. And this is how people learn. Um, I'm gonna give you an analogy. If I told you to go to McDonald's or Burger King and get a Big Mac fries and shake once a week, how healthy are you gonna be? That's like giving your orchid fertilizer once a month. All right, these things are consistently growing all the time. So they're always looking for nutrients. Inside these pots, there's no nutrition. All right, it's like giving you a bowl of styrofoam peanuts and going, good luck. Um, there's no nutrition in those pots. You have to fertilize them. You have to use a fertilizer with them. Now, I didn't bring, I didn't bring any back here this time because I don't normally um, suggest doing them as a way to fertilize the plants. And that's a slow release pellet. Now when you repot the orchids, you can put a slow release pellet on top. So as that plant is getting readjusted back into the pot, it's always getting a little bit of food every time you water because that fertilizer will release food into the pot and onto the roots when you water it. Now, to feed them, you need to be using a water-soluble fertilizer. It's the only way you're delivering food to that plant on a consistent basis. Well, there's, there's, I've got three different types of fertilizer up here, and I've got one supplement um, to use. The, um, the old standby is better grow, and one is their regular orchid food, and the other is a bloom booster. What they usually recommend is this once a week for three weeks. The fourth week of the month, you put the bloom booster on it. So you switch it up and you give it a little bit of extra food. Now, do the commercial growers do this? No, they don't. Commercial growers are using a 20-20-20. This has all the nutrients your plant's going to need to flower, root, and grow new foliage. It's going to give it everything it needs. It's a balanced fertilizer. It's going to do everything that that plant wants it to do. So some people will just use this, and sometimes they'll add a bloom booster at the end of the month as the fourth week. But most of them are using just 20-20-20. Because let's be honest, when they're using fertilizer, they're using a 25 pound bag at a time and it's going out over the whole crop. Now, how many of you have heard me talk about the Better Grow head grower, Robert Palmer? Okay, Palmer's Orchids over in Sarasota, Florida. If you ever get a chance to go over there, I highly suggest you take a trip and go see his greenhouse you're going to be blown away by what you can find. Um, Rob Palmer has been voted the number one orchid grower in the state of Florida for probably the last 15 years. He is that good. He is the one that developed that better grow formula for orchids. All right, he has also developed his own cow mag fertilizer, which is basically the same for fertilizer formula that the state, Michigan State came up with. And that's the industry go-to that everybody wants to go to or try to mimic if they're doing orchids. Um, calcium and magnesium during the winter, if a plant is lacking magnesium, what it will tend to do if it's a Cattleya or a Vanda, they'll turn a little reddish in color on the foliage. And you can tell if, when a plant has that magnesium deficiency. So um, the cow mag fertilizer, this is the time of year when you want to give your plants a couple of feedings of cow mag fertilizer. Now, unfortunately, they don't package that in the one pound bags. They only do it in eight pounds and 25. 
because I'm going to be honest with you, most of the people that are buying that are the bigger um, hobbyist growers. So I can tell you guys, if you want, if a couple of you wanted to go together and buy a bag, go ahead, go do it. Um, split it up, divide it up. We've done that in the Orchid Society too. Um, it's a wonderful fertilizer. My only warning to you with the cow mag is once you break that seal and it's exposed to air, it's hydroscopic, which means it starts, okay, if you go out and buy a bucket of damp rid, you know how all of a sudden it soaks up all that water and you've got water in that pot or that cup? That's what this will do also. So keep it in an airtight container or Ziploc bags and keep it sealed. If you do put it in Ziploc bags, try and push as much air out of that bag before you seal it off. But it is probably one of the best fertilizers that you can use. That is all I'm using. I'm not using any of the other stuff anymore. I go straight to Palmer's fertilizer formula. Um, I've had better results out of that than I have anything else, and it covers my cold issues, and I don't have to worry about it. Um, now, am I going to recommend to you guys all to go to it? Sure, I'd recommend you to go to it. I'm more concerned that you're at least giving them something. I don't care if you're giving them the Better Grow fertilizer or the Jax Bloom Booster or the Jax 202020. As long as you're putting fertilizer on them, they've got to have some kind of water soluble fertilizer. How many of you have Osmocote at home? Do not use this on your orchids. Osmocote, when it drops, it's, when it releases its fertilizer, it's a heat and, and moisture release. So when it gets hot and humid, that fertilizer releases all the fertilizer out of that pellet at once. So it, it's instantaneous. It's not a true slow release in Florida. Up north, it is a true slow release. You can use Osmocote up north. You cannot use it in the state of Florida. Um, it will burn the roots on your orchids. So just a, a friendly heads up and warning. Now, Question. yes. I have some Osmocote only because my sister told me to buy it. Can you put that on uh, acid plants and alkaline plants? Or you should be able to, but any acid-loving plant likes an acid-loving fertilizer, so use something so else. Acid yeah. And, yeah, use something else, but don't use those on orchids. No. Yeah, don't use those on orchids. What about scallops? No. Nope. Not on orchids. Miracle Grow? That kind of stuff? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They make it for orchids. I don't like theirs. Okay. Um, I don't find that um, their fertilizers are what they once were. Um, Jack's um, was Jack Peters. That was Peters Fertilizer Company at one point. Um, it was bought out by miracle Grow, or Scott's, I think, one of the two companies. They changed the formula a little bit. It's not the same. It's not as good as what it was. Um, he had a no-compete clause. That clause ran out, and he got sick and tired and went back into the fertilizer business and started up Jack's. Instead of calling it Peter's, it's called Jack's now. That Peter's is probably one of the best fertilizers I can recommend to you to use for plants and orchids. It's a good good fertilizer, one of the best. Um, like I said, you know, if you're, if you're gonna feed your orchids, feed them something. I don't care what you use, but please use something. Now, yes, sir? Yes, it will work on other plants. 202020, you can use, it's a balanced fertilizer. You can use it on just about anything except acid-loving plants, which are azaleas. Um, yes. If you can get a wisteria to grow down here, sure. Up north, yes. Now, how many of you are mixing your fertilizer up in a watering can and putting it on your orchid and seeing it just drain out through the bottom of the pot? Everybody should have their hands up on this one. Um, when you fertilize your orchids, when you go to put the fertilizer on it, if you haven't watered the plant, orchid roots are white. They have a fleshy coating over the root. All right, that's called vellum. 
It has a mechanism that seals off the root that keeps the moisture in the root. So when you first wet it off, it's going to go from white and it's going to start changing color and it's going to go to green. Once it's green, it's absorbing the nutrients back into the plant. Now, if you're doing a foliar feed where you do put fertilizer on the leaves of a plant, you want to use a spreader sticker. And even when you're doing it in the pot, spreader sticker is soap. It's basically soap. It's what we call in the industry a surfactant. Um, what it does is it helps distribute that fertilizer evenly over the whole leaf. And then instead of you just pouring it on and it dripping off, it sticks to the plant. So it doesn't just, you pour it on and it just drips right back off. Spreader sticker. Spreader sticker, yep. Um, it's like you going into the shower, taking a uh, shower, washing your hair with shampoo. If you don't rinse that shampoo out, you have a film in your hair. What you're doing is you're leaving a residue of film of fertilizer on that plant. So the plant actually has a chance to absorb it. It's going to make any pesticide, fertilizer, or fungicide work 99% better than when you don't use it. I can't recommend something better to use when you're using any kind of chemical or any type of fertilizer. You use both the fertilizer and that? Yes. Okay. You add this. If, if the fertilizer says a tablespoon to a gallon of water, this I believe is either a tablespoon or a teaspoon. I'm not going to open the package up and read it right now because I don't, don't have my glasses on anyways. But follow the directions to a gallon of water with your fertilizer. So. You know, you put your fertilizer in, you put the spreader sticker in, and boom, then it starts working correctly. Um, if you just put the fertilizer in the water bucket and then go to put it on, it's just going to go on it and drip right through the pot and out onto the ground. So it, it's not as effective. You will see better results with your flowers. You'll see bigger flowers. You'll see more flowers if you're using a spreader sticker. There's a bonus to that. How many of you had to put no seam spray on this morning. On me? Yeah, on yourself. Oh, always. Bug, how many of you had to put bug spray on this morning? Spreader sticker has a tendency to knock thrips down, which are no seams. Those little no seams will take a band of flower bud and just destroy it. Um, a spreader sticker, whenever you fertilize, will help knock down the thrip population too. So, you know, it, it does a couple of different things which are beneficial for your orchids, beneficial for all your plants. The best thing with the, with the spreader sticker is it does help to knock down thrip populations. How many of you have gardenias in your yard? How many of you have oak trees in your yard? They're thrip magnets. If you've got oak trees, you've got grass, you've got thrips. So anything that you can, thrips or no seums? Oh, oh. How do you spell that? Thrips. Uh, yes, ma'am. I didn't hear you. T-H-R-I-P-S. Okay. There are 13 different species of thrips in the state of Florida. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I've never heard of no seums, so I think you're over A lot of people used to call sand fleas no seums. But thrips are no seums. And it's all through Florida, even north. Yep. Even up north, you get thrips up north too. Um, unfortunately, because of our pesticide use um, around the country, a lot of the, the one species of thrip, which is the western um, flower thrip, is resistant to some pesticides now. So there's a way around that. There's a new pesticide out called the metacloprid. Um, they are not resistant to a metacloprid. They are resistant to um, um, what is it? Orthene. Orthene, orthene, malathion, um, diazinon. Well, you can't get diazinon anymore, so that's out of the arsenal. Um, our main use for thrips now is malathion, pyrethrin, 
or um, orthene, which is acephate. Acephate stinks. You can smell it a mile away. Um, a lot of the thrips are now resistant to it. Um, Mr. Odom down in Fort Pierce at Odom's Orchids has the University of Florida doing a study in there on what kills flower thrips, the western flower thrip. So they have been researching it and they found that imidacloprid actually does kill the thrip population off. It does get rid of them. So for an orchid grower with, you know, 100,000 orchids, you know, thrips are your worst enemy because you're trying to grow flowers. No, no. Thrips are year round. Um, I've touched on, you know, a couple of the pesticides. Because we are cooler and damper this time of year, you have a tendency to run into fungus and rot more readily this time of year. You can alleviate that if you watch your watering, but there are going to be periods of time when we have these cold fronts that come through where everything gets wet and it just doesn't dry out. You are going to have problems with rot and fungus. My go-to fungicide for orchids is thiamil. Because of the supply chain issue, I'm having trouble getting it. I've had it on order now for four weeks. I've got two bottles left. So I'll auction them off at the end of the program. <laughs> Thiamil. It is a white powder. It's T-H-I-O-M-Y-L. Comes in a little bottle like this. It is um, a systemic pesticide. That means it gets sucked up into the tissue of the plant. The plant actually draws it up into the plant itself. So it has a tendency to give the plant some resistance to fungus and rot. Probably the cheapest and the best fungicide that you can use on the market and the less toxic for you. Okay, that's scale. Grows on the leaves. Grows on the leaves, that's scale. It is scale? It is a scale. It's a little bump, a little hard dot. You can peel it off. Peel it off. Yeah. Um, that's scale. The, 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 the insecticides that I've told you about will control scale. If you want to get rid of them, you can flip, you know, pick them off with your finger or a cotton ball, um, soaked with rubbing alcohol, and just wipe them off and clean them off. Okay. But the systemic... Um, insecticide, which is the metacloprid and the acephate, will help give your plants protection against the insects. Acephate and what? And metacloprid. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> is that caused from the, too much water? Or no, just the that's an insect. an insect. It's an insect that comes in on plants. Catalea orchids are more susceptible to scale, so are oncidiums. Phalaenopsis, you typically don't see scale on them that often. I've, I very rarely have I seen scale on thales. I've seen it on cats. It gets gooey. Hmm. It makes the... Yeah, sticky. Okay. Yep. Can you put that in with, with when you're fertilizing? No. You never mix fertilizer with insecticide or fungicide. You do them separately. They're separate treatments. And how often do you do those? If you're doing an insecticide, it's one application, then a second application 10 to 14 days later. And that'll be on the, the directions? It's on the directions. I, I'm going to tell every one of you, you know, I've been working with this stuff for a long time. Um, I still read the directions every time I use one of these products because I work with so many different ones, I don't commit them to memory, and I'm going to tell you the same thing. Read the directions. As an employee of a nursery, I am legally bound to tell you to read the instructions on these chemical packages every time. Um, I've seen two people, one person with brain cancer from some of this stuff, 
I've seen another one where it has crystallized his lungs and he's down to 30% use of his lungs because of the fungicide and pesticides that he sprayed. Now, that's because he wasn't wearing a respirator, he wasn't wearing the proper clothing, he was going in a white t-shirt, shorts, flip-flops, and going in in the middle of a, a fog bank. Well, you can't fix stupid. So, you know, he's dealing with his own issues because of that. But anytime I use this stuff, I'm wearing rubber gloves, I'm wearing a respirator. I don't play around with it. I'm not taking that chance. A very close friend of mine's wife um, passed away about three years ago from brain cancer. From, and she was the one that sprayed their greenhouses with all the chemicals. The husband didn't. The wife did all the spraying. She's the one that developed the brain cancer. And she, you know, after she did, she passed away about a year and a half after it was discovered. So, you know, use these things, use them wisely, use them correctly, and use, you know, the proper PPE, okay? Um, a couple of the different ones that you can use. Um, for insect control, this is liquid acephate or orthene, it's called liquid acephate. This is one of the things for the systemic insect control. This gets sucked up into the tissue of the plant. This is a metacloprid. All you have to do with this is attach it to the hose, go through and spray the orchids. So it makes it much easier. Now if you've got one or two plants that you've got problems with, use a three in one. This will cover you for fungus, mites, spider mites, or insects. So we've got different products that you can use, but come to one of us and we will help you and walk you through it, okay? Um, how many of you have ever used a copper fungicide? Do not use copper on your orchids. Why? Does anybody know why? It's not dangerous. No, it stain them. It, well, it might stain them, but it does something else to or certain orchids and bromeliads and Tislandia, the air plants. Copper kills them. Dead. Done. End of story. So do not use a liquid copper fungicide on your orchids. Um, I try to steer people away from it. There's a couple of varieties of orchids that can handle copper. Um, and then there are others that will kill them dead as a doornail. Um, the hard cane dendrobiums, it will kill them dead as a doornail. You spray them with copper, they're done. They're dead. Um, Cattleyas, though, you could spray Cattleyas with copper. It won't kill them. Okay? Um, I'm going to get away a little bit from the pesticides and fungicides, and I want to talk more about fails. Um, feeding them, how to take care of them in the house, and then how to repot. Who here has not repotted a Phalaenopsis before? Come on up. I'm gonna give you guys two chances. Okay. Everybody knows when they get the, grower, the fails from the growers, they're typically coming in moss like this, right? Some people grow them in bark, some people grow them in moss. Now there's a mixture that looks like bark in here and some moss. This is the only orchid that I will recommend to you that you can actually repot while it's got flowers on it and it won't drop the flowers, okay? Now the moss comes in bags like this. Okay, to use this stuff, you have to take it out. And put it in some water. What that moss is doing is it's starting to absorb the water again, so it becomes useful. Now, how many of you grow them outside where they get rained on? 
You want to grow those orchids in bark. You don't want to grow them in moss. The reason, the reason being that, okay. The reason, the reason you don't grow Phalaenopsis if they're getting rained on um, in moss is if we start getting those winter cold fronts and that rain comes through like it does every other night, it seems like, they never get a chance to dry out. They will rot quicker. So if you're growing outdoors where they get rained on, grow them in bark, grow them in a basket, grow them with bark. Um, you can put them in a pot. Just make sure that it's well draining um, bark mixes. Um, and then grow them in a pot and hang them up outside. But don't grow them in moss if you're gonna grow them under a covered roof or if you're gonna grow them inside the house, okay? Now for you, to repot an orchid is actually, a Phalaenopsis is probably one of the easiest orchids that you can repot. Um, they're very simple to do. This one, usually I recommend you buy an orchid that actually has a name tag on it. You're gonna find the ones at Home Depot and Lowe's that don't have name tags on them. Um, I don't recommend those guys because you can't show them. You can't take them to a show if they don't have a name on them. And I wanna know what the, the lineage is on these guys. Now, what you're gonna see on this is when you start taking this out, and, this, it, and I'm seeing it already in this, when you go to repot these guys, if the moss is staying too wet, the roots are gonna rot out on it. And I'm seeing it already, see this? See how it's flat, it's got no meat to it. That's got a little bit of meat on it. That's got a little bit of meat on it. Um, but this, yeah, if they're flat and mushy, that means it's rotted. So you have to be really careful. I don't want any of that moss in my drink. Yuck. Um, you don't want to keep them sopping wet all the time. Typically with the orchid room, I've got a fan in there to move the air around. There's air conditioning in there, so it helps dry them out a little bit faster. I try to let them dry out in between when I take them out and water them. I pull them out of the room, set them up on carts, and go through and water each pot until the pot is wet. On a fail with sphagnum moss in the state of Florida, you should be repotting every year. Sphagnum moss in the state of Florida rots and decomposes within six to nine months. So they should be repotted in the state of Florida. Now up north, if you're up north and you've got them up north, they can actually go a couple of years in the same pot of sphagnum moss. They cannot do that down here. Now you, you Right, right. What, what happens with that sphagnum moss in the state of Florida is because of the heat and humidity, it tends to break down and rot much quicker um, and it goes bad within six to nine months. Uh, by nine months, it's probably already going bad. So you wanna repot, take the orchid out and put it in new moss each season, okay? Now you can see by this one, you know, most of the foliage or the, the flesh on the roots is rotted it's gone so it's it's this needed to be repotted now I've had most of you most how many of you have been to one of my orchid classes before okay so you guys know what I'm doing for those of you that have not seen this orchids are susceptible to viruses so you do want to um, sterilize your tools between plants, and I do it with just a simple plumber's torch. You just turn the knob, press the button, and the flame's on. To turn it back off, you just twist the knob, and it's off. Easy, not dangerous, very easy to use. The best way to sterilize your tool. All right, no, no. because you're gonna burn your finger by the time you sterilize the tool. You could, 
if you can handle, you know, branding your finger with the end of a lighter. I recommend the plumber's torch. You can actually buy little creme brulee torches that are like 12 to 15 bucks. Um, you can find them at any kitchen store, and I think even Home Depot and Lowe's sells a small little handheld one. Very easy to use, and you know, if you're growing orchids, you should have one in your arsenal anyways, okay? Now at this point, you've seen that all the roots are bad on it, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back through and clean up what's no longer any good. So anything that's flat, that has no meat on it, comes off. And the root, just for you guys that are new to this, the root is not actually this, all right? The root is this little hair. That's your root. The stuff around it is called vellum. That's the stuff that protects the root from losing all its moisture. So what I'm doing is anything that's just a bare root is going to die anyways. So I want to clean those all off. Yeah, this is, that's actually the root, little white thing. Right there, that that's the root there. itself. Okay. See how that's all flat? You can feel it. Doesn't? Yeah. There's no meat to it. That's crazy. And then if you feel this one, it's nice and thick and hard. Oh, wow. Yep. So that's the root. Those are the roots that you want. You see, this one's flat. There's nothing to it. And this plant's gonna know to put out new roots. Now it's got, see this one's no good too. And that's what happens when they you water too much. It just, that's what. So should people be checking that? Yeah, they should be. Well, they should every time they repot. Every time they repot? Yeah. So if you're not repotting, you're gonna lose the plant. So. And you can clean them right back up. Now this plant, within a couple of weeks, is going to start generating new roots very easily. Okay? Wow. All right? Now, at this point, you can see what's left on there. There's not much. It only has viable roots on it now. I've cleaned all the old dead roots off. This thing's ready to be repotted. Now, Phalaenopsis orchids, the way the root grows is the plants here, and the roots come down like a spider's legs. All right, they hang down like that. To do a phalaenopsis to repot them, you want to use, I'm going to stick this guy right here. And we're going to talk about him in just a second. Is once this stuff is, you know, soaked up all the water it's going to soak up, you take it out. You wring it out. You wring it out and put it in a bin like this. You just want to rehydrate it so it will start soaking up water again. Sphagnum moss, when it dries out real hard, has a tendency not to want to soak water back up. And sometimes what I'll do is if I find one that's in moss that hasn't soaked up any water, so I'll take it and I'll actually soak it in a cup of water and let the moss actually rehydrate. When the moss dries out, it will pull away from the sides of the pot. For Phalaenopsis, I prefer moss if I'm going to grow them inside. If I'm growing outside, I will grow them in bark. Especially me with the way I water, because I water so heavily, I want to make sure that those roots have a tendency to dry out. Now, these did not dry out that well, so most of the roots that were in there had rotted. So it's time to repot it. So do you soak the bark? Um, some people do, some people don't. That's, you know, there's conflicting opinions on that. And I'm going to tell you, do what you think you're comfortable with. 
Um, if it's a good bark mix, it's going to dry out in between watering. If it's a, a mediocre to moderate bark, it may have some stuff in it that stays a little moist. Now, the Better Grow Orchid Fail Mix has some other stuff in it that will stay wet a little bit longer. So be a little more hesitant with that to you know, wet it before you. If you're using just bark, sure, you can wet it without a problem. That I would not wet that before I used it, okay? Now, the, here's where you get to have some fun. Now, like I said with the orchids on fails, the way the roots grow is they grow down like a ball or a spider's legs. So you want to take a clump of moss like this, put it up underneath the roots, let the roots hang over the side of it. This is where you get to have the fun. So hold it like that. You take the ball of moss, mm -hmm. put it up underneath, Okay, and then what you will do with moss afterwards is sometimes I'll fluff it up a little bit and I'll take it and I'll put it around. You don't have to pack it. Not to? Nope, you don't have to pack it. And I don't suggest that you do pack it in. You want it to be kind of fluffy and around the root ball, okay? There is over right there where her orchids are leaning against a little paper thing. There's oh. three green plastic pots right here. Oh, wait, right there. Sorry. Grab one of those plastic pots. When you put them back in a pot, okay, you want to gently put them down in. Now, we could have probably stuffed a little bit more moss in there, and you could take it and tuck it back there like that, but you don't want to take this and just jam it down in there. You want to leave it fluffy so that when you do water it, it does have some air in between that fiber so that it has a tendency to dry out a little bit evenly. Now, when once you've got it repotted back in the pot, and this is gonna be difficult because of this thing, so let's do this. No, oh no, 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 no. We'll just take it off and leave it there. Okay. Once you put it back in, you can take the spike out, or the stake out, and reinsert it back in that moss. And then what I will do is I will take the flower spike and I'll wrap it around one time on the flower stake just to secure that spike a little bit better. Um, a lot of growers won't do it, some will. Um, I think the better orchid growers will typically wrap this, the spike around the stake a little bit like that just because it helps it stand up better. That is repotted, easy. They're easy to do. There's no reason that you can't repot these. We, it took, what, a couple of minutes? Not even. So thank you very much. Good job. So that's, that's how you repot a Phalaenopsis. Now, if I were to do one, If I'm going to do a fail in bark, and you can see this, it has quite a bit of debris in it. If you wanted to water it to rinse all that dust out, you could, and you can. But like I said, it has some other material in it, like peat, um, that will suck up water. So I usually don't recommend that you do water this. You can use this. Um, just fine either in a plastic pot or you can put it in a basket. If I were to do a fail, <laughs> sure, bring it on up. I don't know what's going on with this one. Okay. Well, I'm a rush. no, it's in moss. This is that little plastic sleeve that I was telling everybody about. 
This is the new sleeve that they're using with orchids because they can't get the hard shell anymore. You want to pass that around, show everybody? That's what they're starting to use now because they can't get the hard plastic. Now your roots in here, they're gone. There's no roots in there. That's where your problem is. It's, they've all rotted. So now the good thing about that is if you look, if you, if you look at the plant, you can see the new root developing. It's, what it's done is it's lifted itself up out of that moss. How long have you had that? This plant? Uh -huh. Probably seven months. Seven months, okay. That's about right. Um, it's actually lifted itself up out of the pot. Now it's trying to put new roots out. So they will do that. They will try and get out of a pot of rotting material. So they will try to get out. So it's, it's still alive, it's still fine. Um, you know, everything down here is all rotted out. It's all gone. So, I mean, that's all gone. That's okay, you've got three good viable roots on that. That plant will come back just fine from that. Now you can do it in bark or you can do it in moss. Depends on where you want to grow it. I put them outside in the lanai. Does it get Spleen. rained on? No. Spleen didn't then go right. back to moss. But you just have to repot every year. So this, you've had it for seven months. I can guarantee you before you it was in that pot for at least a year. Wow. At least a year in that pot. Yeah. See the new root developing? Yeah. You can see the green tip on it. Yeah. See the two new roots here? Mm -hmm. So it will develop new roots on it. Mm -hmm. You guys can see these little green tips on the end of it? That's a good root. Because they haven't been in there, they're not old enough. They will develop aerial roots. Once the plants get a little bit bigger, they'll... Now she asked an important question. She asked, why am I not seeing the roots that hang out over the side of the pot? They're, these plants are still too young. They're not old enough or they've not been there long enough to get the aerial roots. Now the aerial roots, when, when I get a plant that develops aerial roots, how do you tell a fake orchid between a real orchid? Fake orchid doesn't have aerial roots. A real orchid will have aerial roots. They'll have roots hanging out over the side of the pot. They'll grow around the pot. They'll grow on the outside of the pot. They'll hang down. I've got a couple of orchids from Joe Grozafi up in Melbourne that are big specimen cattleyas. I've got a rat's tail hanging down from the pot, and it's all roots. So, any, any of them that are the white with the green tip, those are your good roots. So that's a good root. It's still got some flesh. It's still got flesh to it, so I'm not going to do anything with that. You've got this one right here that's got a little bit of black on the tip, but that one will probably still start growing. So the rest of this is yuck. So that happens. I mean, that happens with fails. It's not a big issue. It's easy to fix just by repotting. Okay? Now for you, Now, if I were to have this orchid and I had, say, an 8-inch pot, this is a 6-inch. You would not put this into an 8-inch. This came out of a little 2 to 3-inch plastic um, film pot is what I'm calling them. It's a sleeve. Um, you can step this up to a six inch. You see the width on the leaves? Mm -hmm. So this can actually be stepped up to a six inch pot. And in bark, it's gonna be happier. It's gonna develop a better root system. I like the bark. Okay. Now, come on up. You're not getting out of this scot-free. <laughs> I make examples of you guys. Okay. It's how you learn. Most everybody's scared to do it and it's not a big deal. How many of you are going to Garden Fest? Guess who's doing Ask the Expert for Garden Fest on orchids? 
again. So you'll get another chance to hear me yak at Garden Fest. All right, so with this, it has some old flower spikes on it. I usually recommend cutting those off, okay? The old dead roots, take them off. Take them off. I did that with one of my plants and then like within weeks I had a whole row of flowers. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about trimming flower spikes at some point? Yes, I will. There is a trick to that. Now we're early in the season for that, so, but I will touch on what to do with it when it goes out of flower. Now, at this point, we've trimmed off any of the roots that I think are bad that need to be removed. The plant doesn't have to fight to try to keep that going or heal it, it's gone. The plant doesn't have to fight that battle anymore, so it's gonna do much better. Now, what I recommend with a plant like this, everybody knows that cattleyas, oncidiums, anything with a pseudobulb, you know what the pseudobulb is, right? Yes, shake your head yes or no. Okay, pseudobulb. Any orchid that has a stem that's a modified stem that is fleshy, um, that's your pseudobulb. The flower spikes usually come out of the pseudobulb at the top, or even like on the Dendrobium noble, that whole cane where the leaves are coming off of is a pseudobulb. Cattleyas, same thing, pseudobulb on them. Now, those hold food and water, so you, you, know, you don't want to cut those off, leave them alone. This does not have a pseudobulb, so it has no way to store food and water, all right? Where was I going with that? <laughs> I'm that tired, you sorry. The, yeah, well, you have to fertilize them. Um, but there's a couple of different things with them. With those guys, you know, when you do trim them up and clean them up, remember that that pseudobulb acts as a battery. It stores food and water for the plant. When you water it, water it well, let it dry out in between watering. This does not have a pseudobulb. A vanda does not have a pseudobulb. The cuttings, that's debatable whether I would call that a pseudobulb or not. Um, I'll have to ask a couple of experts if they would consider that vanda stem, um, that tarit vanda, whether they would consider that a pseudobulb or not. Um, but anything with a pseudobulb, you gotta be a little more careful with and a little more judicious about watering. Now this guy, oh, I know where I'm going, duh. Um, anything with a pseudobulb on it has a front and a back. This only has a top and a bottom. A vanda has a top and a bottom. So the new growth comes from the top on the vandas and the fails. The old growth is down here at the bottom. One of these guys with a pseudobulb, and you'll understand why I'm telling you this in just a second. The new growth on the front of the plant, that's the front side. So the new growth on the plant is the front. The old growth, the small canes in the back, that's the back of the plant. So when you go to repot one of these, you wanna take it, when you take it out of the pot, you wanna put the back side up against the back edge of the pot so that it, when it grows out the next growth, it's growing in the pot. If you were to put it in the middle of the pot, the new growth is gonna come out right outside the pot. All right, now thales and vandas, they're a little bit different because they grow up instead of, you know, growing along like an inchworm. Um, these grow from the center and grow up, up from the top. When you go to repot these, you'll notice that I'm putting them in the center of the pot because that's where they're gonna grow. So when you repot these guys, you wanna put fails or if you're gonna, gonna do a species of vanda, you wanna put it in the center of the pot. Now for this guy, with just a, a few little roots on here, you wanna put it in the center, just, build just gently it. build it in around it. No, it's, I'm holding it up from the bottom 
and I'm putting the bark mix in. Now I'll take my finger and tuck it. I won't, I won't just jam it in there. I'll just gently tuck the bark in there. You don't want the roots to get all knotted up right. tight, right? You want them well, to you, you, do. The you, you do want them to, to fill out and take over the whole pot. Right. So I'm just gently tucking it in and firming it up a little bit. I'm not really jamming it down. Some growers you'll see will take an old stake and they'll sit there and jam the stake in there and really tuck that bark in there. Don't do that because you're damaging the root. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Is there a combination no, bark? I would not. No. I would do one or the other um, because you. It depends on your watering. So if you're getting rain every afternoon, you've got to plant in bark with moss. That moss is going to stay soaking wet, and it's going to have a tendency to rot. Right. Could you keep it indoors? Indoors, I'd do it. Now, we're only talking fails right now. Yeah. I'm not talking cats or dens or anything else. Um, for fails, I would do one or the other. And depending on where you're growing, would depend on what I potted in. Okay. They do, you know, they'll do, if you're willing to, once, you know, here's the thing with this, because it's embarked, the minute you pour water in this, water's gonna go right through it. Well, that's fresh, brand new bark, you're gonna put water on that, the water's gonna go right through it, and it's gonna come out the bottom, and it's gonna be done. And you're gonna go, boy, I'm not really watering these things. And you may wanna water them more frequently. Be careful about that, because the water inside, down in the center of that pot, may still be damp. So when you water, you know, I'm watering fails in bark twice a week. That's it. Yeah. Okay, now if I've got a, a fail in moss, I'll put it in the kitchen sink, fill up the pot full of water, let it, let it soak for about five minutes, let it drain out, and I'll go back through and fill it up again, let it drain, I'll put it back in the kitchen or on the dining room table or on the coffee table where I'm gonna enjoy it in a decorative pot. I'll typically leave them in plastic, but I'll put them down inside a decorative pot. Okay, now you can do the same thing with this. Once this gets yeah, right. to flower, you could pot. bring it inside, put it in a decorative pot. And that's, that's how you repot these guys. Now with the baskets, there, it's a little bit trickier with the baskets because a lot of this bark is so fine it just falls between the cracks on the baskets. There's a couple of things that you can do. You can either put weed mat, um, down on the bottom, or you can put a layer of sphagnum moss down on the bottom just to fill in between the slats on the bottom of the basket. Then you can pot them with bark. What about coconut fiber? You can use coconut fiber too. That'll help stop the bark from falling through. If you want to use coconut fiber as a potting material, even you can use that as well. Just remember it will tend, it will have a tendency to hold a more, you're talking about the fiber strand not the, like core, not ground up coconut. No, it's like string. Okay, like string. Yeah, you can use that as a potting material. It will drain relatively quickly and dry out fairly quickly in a basket. If you wanted to use it in a pot, just watch your watering. I put that on the bottom and then I put the bark on the top. Perfect. That stops the bark from falling out of the bottom of the basket or the pot. Now you don't need to do it in a, in a pot, Thank just you. in a basket. So all repotted, good to go. Thank you. Okay. What do I do with that one? Should that one should just, since it doesn't really have a drainage, you know, unless I put a hole in it. She's, you know, she bought, you'll see, and I know where you bought this. No, my girl, no, I didn't buy it. It was a gift. My girlfriend brought it to my house. So I didn't want to throw it away when it started looking bad because it was a gift. So I figured I could save it. I'll challenge myself. Yeah, keep, keep, digging, keep digging, keep digging, keep <laughs> digging. I'm sure she got it at Home Depot or Lowe's, one of the two. You'll see a lot of decorative pots don't have drain holes in them. Take the orchid out of that, water it that way. Then once it's done watering and you've let it drip dry in the sink, then put it back in here. If it, if it, watch it after a couple of, like an hour or so. If there's water down on the bottom, pull it out, drain the water out. The number one killer of fails is too much water. Okay. Okay. Is there any plant I could put in here, like maybe a pentu or something? <laughs> maybe 
Maybe I'll just drill a hole on the bottom. You can try drilling a hole. Look, the number one killer of plants is a pot with no drainage. Yeah. They sit there in rotten mud. So it's a decorative pot. Use it as it as it is. If you find a plant in a small three inch pot or a two inch pot, put it in that, but or don't pot it directly in it. It's a, a little rubber plant. So do you think silk. That the ceramic pots are better than the plastic pots? Well, there's, there's debate on that and there's a reason for that. Fails, because they don't have a pseudobulb, they can't store food and water. Okay, so they've got to dry out in between watering. Now with phalaenopsis, because they don't have that pseudobulb, they've got to retain a little bit more moisture. Most people will keep them in plastic. Now if you're going to grow outdoors, you want to grow them in clay pots, you can. The thing with a clay pot is it's porous. So it will wick the moisture away from the root ball so that when you pot it in, it'll dry out in between watering. Okay? Yep, that's, a, that's an orchid pot. Orchid pots have the extra drainage in them. So. Question, is the stem going to, you know, where it actually has the spikes and the flowers, is that going to come like from? It will. It's going to have to develop some new roots first. Give it a chance. I would wait a week before I, I would water it, but I would not fertilize it yet. Go with your fertilizer at half strength. Um, give it a week feeding because it only has three little roots, be careful with it. Don't overwater it. Um, remember that it's got to grow some new roots. Would I do the fertilizer where you mix it with water or just do it? With water. Yeah. With, mix it with water at half strength. It's, if, if it's telling you a tablespoon to a gallon, use half a tablespoon. If it's telling you a teaspoon, use half a teaspoon. Make it weaker. The term is weekly, weekly. So you use a weaker formula of fertilizer every week instead of a full, you know, a full dose of fertilizer once a month. Your orchids are going to fare much better off of a weaker formula every week. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, depending on what it is, I usually do. Um, I water like every Tuesday and Friday or Saturday. Um, the Friday or Saturday is typically when fertilizer gets put on, when I can actually spend some time with the plants and go through and fertilize them correctly. But remember, I have what's called a fertilizer injector. So I mix up my fertilizer concentrate in a big barrel and it gets sucked into the water lines. So every time I water, they get a little bit of fertilizer every time I water. Now for you guys at home, you can, you can use a hose-in sprayer. Now we have finally gotten them, and I've been looking for them. We did the trade shows, they finally had them. These are 20 gallons and six gallon you know, feeders. All you have to do with this is put like a tablespoon, depending on how many gallons of mix you want to do. You use, um, I think it's one tablespoon, you fill it up with water to the one gallon mix, put the tablespoon in there, mix it up, shake it up, put it on the end of the hose and spray it on the orchids. The instructions are on the back of the bottle. They're very easy to use. I have been using the miracle Grow hose and sprayer, which is a one to 16 inch, or one to 16, uh, 16 ratio. It's one fertilizer to 16, one tablespoon of fertilizer to 16 tablespoons of water. So one to 16. Um, I've been using that. Um, these are much easier because you can dose it at a smaller level. So if you've only got five or ten orchids, you don't want to mix up enough fertilizer, you know, a whole pound of this. You know, the miracle Grow hose and sprayer, I put a whole pound of this and I fill it up and then top it off with water, shake it up, then I'll attach it to the hose and go through and spray everything. But I'm also putting spreader sticker in there too. So we'll dose out that spreader sticker. But with these, I mean, you can control how much you're using on these. These are, these are awesome. I mean, these are absolutely fantastic. Are you using a spreader sticker with the fertilizer together in that? Yes, oh, okay. spreader so sticker with fertilizer. Okay. If you're using a pesticide or a fungicide, you use a spreader okay. sticker with that also. Are it makes them work, okay?